Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Continuing the CAT Mining Technology Journey. I'm Bill Deers, the Sales Support Manager with Mining Technology here at Caterpillar. With me today will be Chief Engineer Michael C. Murphy. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Bill. Before we get started, can you give the audience a little bit of your background and how you found yourself here? Sure. I've been at Caterpillar now nearly 39 years. Mm -hmm. Background as a civil engineer and a mining engineer. I've really been around mining Caterpillar most of my life. I moved here from Australia 21 years ago and started in the early days of our technology group here in Peoria. So when you think of it 21 years ago, uh, we were on the early stages of mining technology compared to where we are today. Today as chief engineer, I in terms of surface mining and technology, I spend most of my time looking at where's the mining industry going, what's their technology strategy, where customers are heading. So a little bit of my background in this, in this space. So, you know, it's funny, Michael, we, we've chatted before, you know, when I came out of mining school, you know, we had a lot of the same challenges, but didn't have the, some of the tools and technologies that the mine sites have available today. And it, it's just great to be at this point in time because of the excitement that you see and going on in the industry. Um, and that what we're going to do today is kind of walk through the, um, the autonomy and mining. And I thought, Michael, maybe we could go through maybe three steps. First of all, we could level set let them know about you know where is everything today including ourselves and then maybe we could take a trip back in time and talk about how did we get to this point and then maybe we can finish then with um uh, where are we going where's the future does that work sure okay fantastic so let's go ahead and talk about today and maybe we can start underground um what is the state of autonomy underground great bill in terms of underground in actual fact we actually started in underground with automation programs in the early 1990s and really the focus underground is around safety, obviously very confined environments. Sure. And then the other issue is productivity and utilization underground. You think how long does it take a person to get from the surface out to the work area underground? It's a significant amount of time. So what we're doing with automation in underground is actually with LHDs is actually having one person being able to automate an LHD away from the works surface, maybe at the surface or maybe in a control room underground. And what they're doing is the machine is actually auto loading, auto digging, and then auto dumping and traveling. An operator is just taking over at certain times for certain parts of the, of the process. Real advantage of that is the machine can run faster, does less damages because automation can keep the machine off the walls, stop it from doing damage. So really underground automation is really the greatest opportunity in terms of safety and productivity in the underground space. So an operator is still involved, Yes, but it's more on a ratio and the machine is doing a lot of the uh, thinking as it's going through the process. Exactly. A lot of smarts on board the machines, a lot of smarts in the, in the office computers, managing that whole process and increasing the productivity of those machines. Of course, as you realize, those machines can have nearly a virtual shift change, right? Um, you can have some on the surface, just hand over, keep the machines running throughout that shift change, which really helps increase the productivity out of the underground machines. Absolutely. So using that same thought process, let's go ahead and go up on the surface sure. for a moment. And I know we're going to spend a lot of our time talking about the pit to, uh, from the pit to the crusher mm -hmm. in the automation side. But let's first start with the dozer, right? Because the dozers, a lot of dozers out there, large mining dozers, they're utilizing a lot of different ways, overburden removal, et cetera. Can you talk to us a little bit about where autonomy is with large dozers? Sure. We actually have uh, semi-autonomous tractors. We call them semi-autonomous. I'll get a little more into that. We have semi-autonomous D11 tractors working actually in the Powder River Basin here in the United States and then in Queensland, Australia. Those applications are working around drag lines, pushing material in front of the drag lines to create the bench. And of course, D11 tractors have been doing that for a long period of time. Absolutely. Now, the advantage of having automation in that space is a number of areas. One is you get the operator off the machine, so the operator is not getting all that vibration. The other advantage is actually you can run the tractor at a steeper grade, which an operator physically cannot stomach for a 12 hour shift. And also the productivity through a 12 hour shift is very consistent. Whereas what you find is if it's a manned operation, it's very hard for us humans to work 12 hours in a physical environment like that and have constant productivity through the shift. 
Now what we have is, in that application, this is what we call a semi-autonomous. We really have one operator who's operating typically three or four machines, and he's managing the exception. Maybe as a hard spot, he needs to take over the machine. But the machines are primarily working 99% of the time, 95% of the time, dozing by themselves, operator just takes over, maybe a hard material, and move, it out, move them out of the area to refuel, those type of things. Now the real advantage of course is increased utilization just like underground they can work through a shift. Obviously you know people can work uh, in a very safe environment and so we're seeing significant advantages of running semi-autonomous tractors in these applications. So you could still have an operator on a one-to-one -one relationship with the remote control. Correct. Just operating the one dozer maybe getting the operator out of harm's way because they're you know a slide area or something right. But now it's evolved and the stations and the technology evolved where now you're talking one operator to multiple machines. Mm -hmm. Okay. And pr the primary applications for that today are? In, as I said, in front of drag lines. Now we see other applications for that, the technology moving out of that application uh, longer term. We actually see that in terms of uh, dump dozing is another great application we're exploring. And then the other application we're looking at is stockpiles. Now, one of the biggest challenges on stockpiles is actually from a safety perspective, operators will often get too close to the edge and put the machine into the hopper, which is going to be significant, can be a life-threatening type event. So yeah. lots of opportunity to take automation in this space and really make a step change in safety. One of the things you're going to hear us talk about a lot about what we're seeing coming out of automation is this big step change in safety. You know, the mining industry is very safety conscious and automation is really going to provide that real big change from a safety perspective. Excellent point. So, you know, we, we talked a little bit about dozers, right, and their, sure. their applications. So what I'd like to do now is move to um, start with the drilling process. Mm -hmm. And can you tell the, the audience a little bit about what's going on with drilling? Drilling is one of the, you know, Whereas tractors, trucks, we're talking about productivity, drilling is about precision. It's about getting the hole in the right location to the right depth. And that's what automation does for, for you. Now we have terrain out there today which are manual on, on drills that does very similar, but often it's very challenging for the operator to, you can lose concentration to actually get the drill in the right location. Automation just makes sure it's in the right location every time. And the real advantage of doing that is you get a better blast, better fragmentation, which has huge downstream impact. It means it's easier for the loading tool, less stress on the loading tool. You also get um, less energy usage through the crusher, better material flow through your crusher, and better impact, impact on your processing plant. So it has huge downstream benefits. Most of the studies we've seen and done can show about a 40% productivity improvement by using automation in the drilling process. So it's very significant from a customer benefit. Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, because of all the downstream benefits you get from there, I can see why there's, you know, the continued excitement about where drilling is going. Um, I'm going to leave the loader for a little bit later. Sure. Okay, we'll talk about where that's going. But for right now, let's go ahead and, you know, there's been a lot of talk about autonomous hauling. Sure. Um, and the role we've been playing with autonomous hauling and autonomous hauling overall. So can you kind of, what's the state of the business right now for autonomy? Hauling? Well, we're very excited about autonomous hauling. You know, we have autonomous, nearly 100, actually by the end of this month, we'll have over 100 autonomous trucks running around the world. We'll have them running at four mines. We have an extra two we're also already starting to implement on. In terms of productivity improvements, it's public knowledge. We've seen a 20% plus productivity improvement come out of the Thomas mm -hmm. trucks. But the real big value is the significant impact it has in terms of safety. If you look at the results, what happens is there's been a step change again in safety by introducing automation in that space. By actually working on the processes, working on restricting the number of people in those areas, doing certain things, we've been able to get a significant improvement in safety. So, you know, from an autonomous viewpoint, now we've moved now just on 600 million tons of material with autonomous track fleet. Uh, and then it's an exciting what, why it's changing the way people think about mining. Yeah, absolutely. I know when we, uh, we have a, an area out in Tucson where we actually do live demos of the autonomy. Um, and it's just the, the excitement we get every time that we're going out and, and we're showing where it is because, I mean, it's reality. 
Exactly. Uh, it's, it's, it's not something, it's not theoretical for us, it's not theoretical for the mining companies that we're working with and putting in place. It's reality, and they're seeing the results today. Well, you start to see that. You look through the iron ore op properties in Australia, it's become the norm now to run autonomous trucks, and people are seeing it in, their, in terms of their cash costs. You know, their cash costs are decreasing because of efficiency they're getting out of their fleets. We're seeing it in oil sands, we're seeing it in Latin America as well. So, you know, a few years ago, automation was probably more of a dream. Today, you look at it, it's reality. And people are seeing significant results, as we said, around the safety side, the productivity side. You know, you think of it in terms of an autonomous truck, it doesn't take a break. It's like a virtual shift change. Sure. It doesn't matter how good you are at running a manned operation, to get shift change to work, it's still going to lose 20 or 30 minutes to do a good shift change. In terms of uh, autonomous truck fleet, it's, in, it's in li literally in the two or three minutes. The time for one operator to get down the ladder on the loading tool to the other operator gets up the loading tool. That's how long it takes you to do shift change on an autonomous hauling fleet. The other advantage is that it, machines don't take breaks. They don't take bathroom breaks, lunch breaks. So we're seeing significant increases in utilization of these machines. And of course, it's not just all about utilization. It's also about getting production rates up as well. So that's how we get to the 20% plus. You know, we obviously gain a lot from utilization, but a lot of it's how we design our autonomous truck system to run faster, to work with the operations, and to really get that shift, that truck exchange time nice and tight. Yep. That's where we pick up the productivity improvements with this system. So we're going to explore a little bit more of that in a few moments, but let's let's go back in time a little bit, sure. right? Because this didn't happen overnight. Um, how, what was the journey that we took to get here? I think some people always find that part of this story interesting. Yeah, you know, as a company, we've obviously had a lot of thought about where the mining industry is going. In actual fact, we actually had our first autonomous program started in 1985. Hmm. Think of what technology was like in 1985. That's when Caterpillar officially launched an autonomous program as a research program. Early 1990s, we actually had machines running down in Texas in a quarry. Think of this, two 773s running in a quarry back in that time frame. Think of what your automation, what your technology was like. You know, we didn't have, my cell phone was about the size of a brick. We didn't have an iPhone, we didn't have an I a watch, uh, electronic watch, we didn't have a Fitbit. So technology in those days, it's amazing how we actually could get it to work. But we did, we ran for a number of years. And then back in 1996 at Mine Expo, which is the largest mining exhibition in Las Vegas, we actually demonstrated two autonomous trucks running at our proving grounds down in Tucson. So, that's where we were back in those period of time, way ahead in terms of, you think, automobile hadn't even thought about automation in those space. So we were way out there in terms of working with the technology and uh, figuring out what it could do to the mining business. Now we had that early start, we had that leadership position, and then there was a pause. Well, why did we basically pause on the development side? Yeah, we paused uh, about 1997, 1998. <clears throat> and what happened is, as we went out to the industry, the industry really was not ready for automation as we started talking to customers. The drivers that allowed us to get into autonomy, the second generation around the increased focus on safety, the shortage of workers, for example, in Australia, just wasn't a, a big economic issue back in the mid 1990s. So what happened then is, okay, we realized we were just a little ahead of our time. So we actually put in place what we call the building blocks. We sat back and said, Automation is going to come. Okay. We just don't know when. Let's be ready for it. So we sat and thought, what are all the things we need to create a autonomous, not just truck, hmm. an autonomous mining system? So we started putting what we call the building blocks in place. So around about that same time frame, we came out with what our terrain product and our loading tools and track type tractors. That was one of our first building blocks, which used high precision GPS. We were the first to introduce that to the industry. We came out with, we needed to actually get machine health off the machines. Okay, if you've got no operator on board the machines, you actually need to actually, how do you monitor the machine? Sure. So we developed our VIM system, our onboard monitoring system. We also developed, developed Mindstar Health, so we actually knew what was happening in terms of brake pressure, uh, payload, all those things on board a truck. So we started putting those pieces, pieces that customers could actually use to actually um, get productivity, get increased utilization, availability, 
back in that time. So we started putting all the building blocks in place, realizing that one day automation would be ready. And when you actually go back and look at a, a mine today, an autonomous mine, you'll see all those building blocks are required to move through. So that's how we basically, yes, we stopped the first generation around the mid 1990s, but we actually put in plan a long-term strategy, technical strategy of actually how to get to where we are today. So there we are, we're doing the building blocks, we're, we're helping to grow the man uh, market and, uh, and improvements with the man mind site. Was there, was there an event in your mind that started to reaccelerate the, the autonomous, the full autonomy? Yeah, I, to me the big event was DARPA, well, which was really three events. And for those who don't know what DARPA is, it's actually funded by the Department of Defense. United States Department of Defense. Okay. And what it was, they put money out to universities throughout the US and ran three events. First event, and what they gave these, the colleges, universities, money to actually come up with an autonomous vehicle, and it had to run through, the, the first two events were in the desert. They had to run approximately 100 miles. Okay. First event, no vehicle went more than 20 miles. Wow. However, by the second event, speed became the biggest issue. And you know, the vehicle that Caterpillar sponsored came second, not because of capability, because it just was a little slower. Okay. So lots of progress were made in the automation space in, that period, in a short period of time. And the third event was really the major, major event which happened in the 2007 time frame, which was actually an urban challenge. And it was actually in a used military air, military base where it had all the houses, all the roads, everything there, and it was what's called the Urban Challenge. And that really pushed, pushed the technology to the next level. And if you look at that event, that's actually where Google Cars, uh, Apple Car, all these things started to get their roots. This was the base for all the automation projects that you see today, all coming out of the universities. Now, Caterpillar's engagement, we actually were engaged with two universities. We engaged with Carnegie Mellon, which actually won that race. We had our engineers embedded in that team. And we had the team, for a number of years, our engineers have been working very closely with Carnegie Mellon. And we also had engineers embedded with Virginia Tech as well, which came in third. So we gained a tremendous amount of knowledge and coming out of those events of how to actually build an autonomous, second generation autonomous truck. Uh, using the new technology that was coming out of those events. So it was a really a leapfrog in terms of allowing both mining and also automobiles to move to this, what we call the next generation of automation. So uh, we were involved with the DARPA, and some of these relationships still exist today that we started then, right? Exactly. We work very closely with universities today. Uh, we actually have in Pittsburgh an automation center, which is Pittsburgh is considered to be the hub of automation, for, especially around perception technology around the world. And we actually have office based downtown Pittsburgh working on automation. We even have a test track and for a lot of the vehicles we run in Pittsburgh itself. So yes, we work very closely and with other universities around the world in this space. So one of the, as we were getting ready for the discussion, we talked a little bit about certain technologies that, that have played pivotal roles in, in autonomy, and you had mentioned LiDAR. Um, could you tell the group a little bit about what LiDAR is? Sure. LiDAR is actually a, a key part of an automation because it's really part of the perception system. So you can actually, because obviously there's no human there, and so it's really your eyes. And what it's doing is looking out and it's a laser beam going out, detecting something and measuring how long does it take to get back. Now the real thing that came out of the DARPA was really the next generation of LiDAR. And what it is, if you looked at our autonomous truck, you'll see, and you even look at the cars out there running today, you'll see that that LiDAR is spinning. And the reason it's spinning is there's actually 64 LiDAR beams right in that particular device. And they're going out and creating a 3D image of what's in front of it. That's very important. You're trying to determine you've got a large rock in front of you, a person or another vehicle in front of you. So that was the real big takeaway that came out of the uh, DARPA challenge. Now, why is LiDAR important to Caterpillar? Yeah. Well, it's actually important to everyone. What it does, I just think of this around about like headlights on your car. 
Low beam, you can only see so far in front when it's dark. High beam, you can see further down the road. By running the 64 LiDAR, we actually can run that truck at its top speed. It allows us to safely do it. Yes, you can run the truck, truck at that speed without a, high, a long distance LiDAR, but it allows us to really run the truck, and that's how we get more productivity out of, out of the system. We actually now make that LiDAR ourselves, Caterpillar. You know, we've taken it, we've hardened it for our application. As you, as you can imagine, uh, that LiDAR has to run 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week in a very dusty, hot environment, or very, very cold environment. So it runs from minus 40 degrees centigrade to 40 degrees centigrade in terms of the ambience those trucks are working in. So we've built that light out to last in our mining environment. So I, so obviously not all LiDARs are created equal. Right. Uh, number one, but number two, you had mentioned, you know, the productivity gains and some of our advantages over some other autonomous systems out there. And, and LiDAR is one of the pieces that allows us to maintain greater speeds which then results in higher productivity overall for the system. Am I hitting that right? You are. Okay, perfect. So you mentioned a little bit about automotive um, industry. They kind of got the same start, same time we did, um, as far as from the DARPA, right? Yep. Kind of their launch. Um, let's compare the two. What's, 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 what are the challenges like for us versus themselves? What advantages might we have? Can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah. The Technology has obviously came from the same place, but mining has got a lot of differences. You know, from a safety perspective, we actually have a lot more layers of safety protection. We call it layers of protection. And think of it as a mine. For a start, the area where the autonomous machines are working, you don't just order drive in there with any type of process or type of permits. Well, that would be impossible to do with a, sure. in a normal city urban environment. So you actually have to have go through a training, get certified. You obviously got a physical barrier before you get into the Thomas area. And well, that also helps in terms of safety, just reinforces the safety. Every vehicle that goes into that area actually has a high precision GPS area. Think of this just like air traffic control. So every vehicle is known where, it is, where it's heading in that, in that whole area. Now that would be impossible to do in cars. You couldn't fit or retrofit every car out there today with a high precision GPS device. Sure. So we also have, so that actually is one of our key layers of safety. Our perception system, our LIDARs, they're really the last defense. If all the other layers break down, and of course we have process control, of course, but that's our last layer of defense. Whereas automobile, it's the first layer, it's the prime layer of defense. Then the last thing we have is everyone who goes in that area has what we call A-stop. And the A-stop device is like a garage, similar in size to a garage door opener that goes on your belt. Okay. Press that and it will stop all the vehicles, Thomas vehicles in a 300 meter radius. So that's the last layer of defense around the system. So we have multiple layers and that's for our applications. The other thing, and this is where I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between automobile technology and mining technology. You know, most of our energy and effort R&D doesn't go just to get the, the machine to run. We actually got to do something with it. We don't have this to go between A and B. We're actually got to load the material. We've got to get material into that truck. We've got to dump the material. <clears throat> we may have to do some utility work with that truck. So we also got all these other application work we have to do. So it's not just taking a person off the machine. There's a lot of other things that occur in a mining space that doesn't happen in an automobile area where you just need to go between A and B. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, you know when you see uh, like in the Google cars, some of the cars that are out there that are, that are doing that, it's, you know, it's, it's cool, it's, it's impressive. But I gotta admit, when you're standing and you're watching autonomous truck fleet working, it just blows you away just the size and the scale and the uh, just the productivity overall and yeah. the safety. Great point, Bill. You, I mean, these vehicles, you know, got 300, you know, nearly 500 ton of vehicle running at, you know, 60 kilometers an hour down a haul road and there's, you know, 50 or 60 of these running on a mine site. Yeah. I mean, that is, a, and no people in there. I mean, it is a very, I know I've spent a large percentage of my time working in Western Australia for these, these trucks. I mean, it is, Every, you still get goosebumps looking at them and seeing them drive. The part I always find out where it's the 
to me is when I go out there early in the morning and it's dark on the, out in the mine site yeah. and all you can see is the blinking blue lights, the blinking blue lights that tell you it's an autonomous truck and you just see these blinking blue lights just working their way through the mine site. It's just a very different eerie type feeling, but uh, that's where we are today. Absolutely. So speaking about today, let's go ahead and shift gears now and talk about tomorrow. Sure. Um, we'll kind of go back in the, if you don't mind, we'll kind of go back in the same order and maybe reflect back on underground a little bit if we can first and talk about where we believe that's going. Um, Sure. Um, yeah, you know, we started with LHDs underground. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that was for the driver. Now, as, as people are starting to look at the value that's coming out of LHDs, they're now wanting to move to uh, underground trucks. And so we're working on taking, creating an autonomous underground truck. So that's to me is just the next generation. It's just the evolution we're seeing. And also we're seeing significant adoption of the technology underground. People are starting to realize that this just has such a big impact in terms of safety and productivity. So it's more to move more and more of the mind to automation. Um, it's becoming more and more critical to, to, for that to occur. Absolutely. And uh, we alluded a little bit to about partnerships before, partnerships that started in DARPA and so on. but. Just the, the fact of how partnerships, both on underground and surface, are allowing us collectively to work together to accelerate, um, bringing uh, solutions to the customer uh, that benefit the industry. Um, so a really important point, these the partnerships that we've had and built. Uh, as we jump up now back up to the surface, uh, we already talked a little bit about the dozers. You already talked about maybe next phase, BDB, the dumps. Uh, or other areas. I mean, obviously, dozers are, have a lot of different roles and different uh, at the mine site. Um, what about now drills? Where do you see that going? Drills, I mean, what we really see on drills is not, you know, we obviously are doing catapult drills as we speak. Sure. We're also doing, you know, if you look at most mine sites, they just don't have one, just one brand of drill. They have different sizes, different companies. They've got old drills. So we're actually, today, actually, retrofitting non-caterpillar drills in terms of drills technology. So right. drills is obviously a big opportunity to go back and retrofit existing drills out there in the field. Yeah, so we, after the drills, we actually jumped over the loaders and I said, well, we'll get back to it. Let's talk more about the loaders now because that's really, uh, where do you see that going? Each of our automation programs has different ways we start. If you think of the truck, you know, we didn't go through operator assist and then work our way up a building block. If you think of the tractors, we actually started with remote control, uh, line of sight, non-line of sight to semi-autonomous, right? That's where we started. I'm gonna do a very similar approach with, with the loading tools. The value in the loading tool is not taking the operator off the machine. The value in the loading tool is actually Increase, decreasing the cycle time, getting the machine to actually uh, have shorter load time, taking the, the workload off the operator as much as possible and allowing him to concentrate on certain tasks. So what we see starting on the loading tool is auto swing, auto dump, truck spot. In actual fact, the other thing we're doing is, you know, auto spotting the truck because that really has a significant advantage of, of getting the truck in the right location, which makes the operator's job a lot easier and get more productivity. And of course, being able to auto dig with the machine, um, with new algorithms coming out, auto dig capability. And we're taking that auto dig capability from what we've actually done underground and we're also doing some on the service as well, large wheel loaders as well. So basically a stepped approach to using um, automation on the loading tool really operate a lot of operator system functions and then one day we'll take the operator off the machine and maybe like the track type tractors have one operator managing maybe three four uh, loading tools but it's going to be a, a more of a focus on operator assist through these various steps of automation and that will actually give us the greatest productivity out of the loading tools because what we're trying to if you can increase the loading tool productivity you obviously increase the total mine productivity coming out of, out of, out of that particular mine so that's our focus area okay uh, you know as we shift to trucks and you're talking about productivity you know as we even when we went through engineering school because people were a part of the the, um, the the mine design everything was chasing bigger right everything had to be bigger equipment but so that you had fewer trucks and bigger loaders etc 
what's the impact of autonomy having on mine designs in the future of mining, especially as it relates to hauling? Yeah, Bill, I started in this business nearly 40 years ago. You know, when I first started, you know, 170 ton truck was the, the biggest truck in those days. And then trucks got bigger and bigger, you know, went through the 80s, 90s. Um, today, yeah, we got 400, you know, we got 400 ton trucks. And then you start to ask yourself, why do you get, why have trucks got become large? And there's really two key reasons, in my opinion. Firstly is larger mines, if you're running an 80 to 100 truck mine, you know, you get congestion issues. Secondly is a lot of us to do with the operator, um, cost of operators, shortage of operators, number of operators. So mines just got bigger and bigger trucks. So what a lot of customers are doing now is going back and saying, what is the right size truck with automation? Hmm. You know, we've done some recent work that may suggest that certain mines going two size smaller may be the best economic use of autonomous trucks. And a lot of customers out there have done some similar type work and are telling us sometimes even maybe even three sizes smaller. So there's a lot of debate now within the industry, you know, what is the optimum size now that we've taken the operator out of the machine, getting a 20% plus productivity improvement, what is the optimum size of the machine? Um, the advantage obviously in a deep pit operation, if you can narrow those haul roads up, the amount of material movement is significantly less, which has a huge impact on the MPV. So, you know, lots of work in this space. And I think we're going to see some changes maybe coming as, as automation expands about what's the size of a future mine, size of truck fleet in a future mine moving forward. It's, so it's really interesting then to really see the, the huge impact this is having uh, right. on, on design, results, et cetera. So. Well, and one thing we talk about, the worst thing you can do is actually take an autonomous truck and just run it as though it's a manned mine. You've actually got to, because you know all the processes are all designed on man mine. What you've got to do is actually sit back and say, how do I optimize autonomy in that application? And once you do that, then you'll get these significant productivity improvements. So you really got to change your mindset. Just just putting a, a making an autonomous truck does to do what a man does is not a very good use of automation. Absolutely. Um, all right, so the audience has been listening to us now, chatting for a little bit, and if they're interested or if they're contemplating autonomy, you referred to building blocks earlier. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that? What should they be focusing on today in order to make that journey? If you look at, and we talked briefly about it, Bill, if you look at what goes in, everyone thinks about, let's, let's take, for example, Thomas Holding as, as maybe the end point for a customer. If you think through that and look at that, it's not just, it's, and we talked about before, it's a Thomas hauling system. So there's lots of pieces that go into make that successful. So if you look at the loading tools, they've all got our terrain product on them. Mm -hmm. So terrain obviously gives you great ability to understand what's the oil quality in front, or in front of you, gives the operator, loading tool operator tremendous amount of information. So that's a technology you can start with today. Yep. Then when you want to make it autonomous, we just add some software over the top of it to actually give the operator a little more functionality when you've got a Thomas truck in the, in, the, in the system. So that's how a lot of our minds are starting. So that's one, one building block. Obviously, we talked about health, understanding what those alarms are, what you're hearing coming off those machines, being able to, to um, again, give you the ability to improve the availability of those machines and understand what's happening on board. The other one uh, <clears throat> around there is, is assignment fleet been able to you know and we're seeing manual operations 10 to 15 percent product improvements by running fleet and of course where our autonomous system is designed our fleet our assignment engines are built into our autonomous it's not a standalone package it's built into it in actual fact that's built as one system so what it does is when you get when to move you need to move from a manual mine running man trucks through to autonomy, one of the advantages you've got, of course, is that you can just switch it over then. So you're putting those building blocks in, in place. And so by putting all these places, your operations, the change managed with your, if your operations is a lot less. People understand how to run terrain. They understand how to run fleet. They run understand how to get health off the machines. So when you want to make the move to autonomous hauling, for example, or autonomous drilling, you've got all these pieces in place that you can just 
work through with your organisation, have a lot less change management through that process. So you can take these building blocks, you have, for example, just kind of recapping, you could put terrain on your drills, you can put your terrain on your loaders, right, get those improvements, you can have fleet to, to run the operation, you put terrain on your dozer. So we've got all these, these components. You talked about health, right, so you're doing these building blocks. Um, and you're still going to get an ROI. I mean, even before you get to autonomy, right, you're, we're having customers get ROIs from months to, you know, a year on their investments, right? Um, same kind of thing with autonomy. I mean, when they finally get to the autonomy state, what's, what do you think the, an ROI is for? Yeah, the ROI, again, in terms of months, maybe yeah. a year or so. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, it's again, it's, a step, it's another step change. If you think the man technology gives you a step change, then a ta automation takes you to the next level as well. Um, but I would say the biggest, where you get the biggest step change besides the productivity is around the safety area. And I want to really emphasize that. That's the thing when you really see a significant in the metrics. I mean, ROI productivity, we talked about, it's only a 15. Yeah, you know, we see on fleet system, we talked 15% plus. Terrain on a, on a tractor, dozer, we see uh, historically 25, 30% productivity improvement. We're seeing terrain on drills, significant productivity improvements. So that gives you about you know, an range of you know, 15 to 20%, 30% productivity improvements. Then you add automation, you'll get another, a lot of these products, you'll get another 20%. Uh, that's what we're seeing out there. So again, pretty significant ROIs out there. And the part is, and I really want to emphasize this, is it starts to make your mind, you actually move with automation to more like a manufacturing environment. So. What this does is it really tightens up your processes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got a bad mind, automation won't fix it. It'll actually probably make it worse. If you've got a good mind, it will make it into an excellent mind. It will help you on your processes and bring that process consistency. So you can start to run the mind with a lot more consistency. Now, <clears throat> I've been around mining a long time. A mine is not like a factory. You know, I mean, the material is just not always consistent. We all know sure. that. but you can move a lot further along this line and this process consistency. And uh, yeah, we've been through this journey ourselves within Caterpillar in terms of you know, using you know, manufacturing techniques to really improve our processes. And we're seeing the customers who are getting these big gains in terms of uh, using automation, really focusing on just getting that consistency of process through their whole operation. Yeah, that's why uh, I'm glad you brought that up, right? Because I know we've been talking a lot about the technology throughout, but it is really the, the, the combination of the people and the process being pulled together to get that ultimate result and that consistency. Um, we've all experienced the customer who maybe made the investment and they got some initial benefits and then dropped off, right? And they had to, you know, we had to go back in and work with them on getting the people and the processes aligned so that they could maximize that benefit. So. Um, now, I think we always assume that everybody understands that Cat Mindstar is able to give those types of results for the mining companies because the product works on all brands. It's not just something we hang on Caterpillar product. And so for the Man Mind site, we, you know, we're able to uh, work on multiple brands. What about autonomy? I just wanted to follow up with you a little bit. Where are we going with interoperability and autonomy on trucks? Good point. Um, maybe let's shift back a little bit. You think back, as I said earlier, we put our first terrain systems out in 1996. Right. We put them on rope shovels. We didn't actually own a rope shovel company in those days. Um, you know, we put our first fleet system, majority of the first fleet system went on Komatsu trucks. So we as an organization have always believed that we need to be able to fit our technology to both Caterpillar and non-Caterpillar machines. That's always been our philosophy. And as we got into the autonomy, the autonomous truck program, you know, you, we, big program, you want to obviously reduce risk, manage it. So we first started with Caterpillar 793 trucks. But interruptibility, we have a lot of customers who own mixed fleets, they own smaller Caterpillar trucks, larger Caterpillar trucks. They also own non-Caterpillar trucks. So uh, last year we made public that, and we are working on a Komatsu 930E autonomous kit. So what we've done is bought ourselves a 930E, it's Komatsu 930E, 
It's down at our proving ground in Tucson, and we're actually fitting it out with so it will run uh, in a in a Caterpillar autonomous mine. So that's working. That will be out running next year on a mine site. Um, so that's how we're managing interruptibility. We think it's very important to our customers that they be our system be able to handle both Caterpillar and non-Caterpillar f- fleets. We're also doing that on, as I said earlier, on the drills as well. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very important issue. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I've, I've really enjoyed this time. I mean, it's been uh, it's exciting to be part of an industry where and a company that's on a leadership position with the technology. Uh, it's great to have an opportunity to to interview someone who basically got Caterpillar going in this industry uh, with technology, Michael. Um, I so I want to thank you for your time today. I know we're we're basically out of time. Uh, Along that line, for, for the audience, we really appreciate you listening in and, and following this discussion. I'm sure you, some of you have questions. We'd love to uh, answer those questions. Feel free to send us uh, your questions to uh, mining at cat.com, and we'll, uh, we'll get back to you as, as quickly as possible and, and clarify anything that you might have. Or if you inter- want to learn more about our products, again, uh, email us at mining at cat.com, and um, we'll get back to you quickly. Michael, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. Cheers.